Thanks, Afsoon. It's great you're wearing the, uh, the animal print as well. We like that. That's great. But thank you. It's a very sobering presentation. Hopefully, you've all got some tips and, and uh, you're going to know what you're going to do and what you're already doing and reevaluate re the position that you're at. So our final panel discussion this morning before we break for lunch, and it's amazing, but we are still running to time, which is fantastic, is talking about something we discussed this morning, the, the low-cost carrier in Africa. Is it a pipe dream? Is it something that we will ever truly see? Is it possible in a high-cost operating environment? So in terms of the panelists, we've been able to, uh, to get a, a wide variety of low-cost airlines, non-low-cost airlines, airports as well, to give their side of the story. But the moderator is somebody who's, um, when I asked him how I, uh, what, what job title he would like on his badge, he said, uh, old man of African aviation. So I said, no, 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 we can't have that. So we, we, we've gone with industry expert, and I think you'll all agree that uh, Germawake, Ato Germawake is, um, is definitely that. He's supported this event since Avidev even really existed. 2015, we did a hotel conference in uh, Addis Ababa, and he helped me put together the first panel on air connectivity as part of the hotel side, and uh, has been to every single um, event since, and is a real inspiration. Um, you will all know that he was uh, CEO of Ethiopian Airlines for seven years, and he's the person responsible, really, for that astronomical growth you saw in the, in the 2000s, and to Walde, who sits there now in, uh, in, the, in the CEO's office, was his apprentice. So what he doesn't know, um, I'm sure uh, there, isn't many, there isn't much out there that he doesn't know. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Germa up to the stage to, uh, invite, uh, to invite his panelists up. So please welcome Germa. Go on, keep clapping. I think he deserves that. He's going that way. Okay, the steps are here. <laughs> Hello, sir. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. I think it's a good afternoon already. Africa Was, is not very successful in aviation, as you know. Successful in creating the aviation environment, but unfortunately, it has not succeeded to maintain good airlines. When I say good airline, I don't mean airlines like, that look good but airlines that make money. But it is not a hopeless situation. There are airlines that are making money, and there are still new airlines that are coming into the game. Today, we are going to discuss about the future of low-cost carrier in Africa. When we talk of low-cost, it, it really means airlines that can provide a low ticket price to the customers. That's what it boils down to. Now, we know in Africa, government's tax tickets as if there is no tomorrow. Airports are monopoly. Handling companies are monopoly. And therefore, how can an airline make air ticket cheap and low? Today, the total traffic through and into Africa is around 120 million. And in the next 20 years, it will be 230 million passengers. So if we don't prepare today, we'll not be able to cope up with the traffic that we are going to see tomorrow. So to discuss this, I have Ahmed Ali. Please, Ahmed, come over.
Sylvain. <laughs> Mr. Rolson in Handy, because it was difficult to pronounce the first name. <laughs> and Richard. Thank you all for coming, and we'll start our discussion. My first question will be to Fast Air, because we are discussing low-cost airline, and Fast Air should be the one to answer this first. <laughs> what is your experience in Africa? Um, the experience of uh, Fast in Africa started five years ago. And um, we've tried uh, applying the low-cost model to various jur jurisdictions. And um, what we can say is that um, um, there is a future for low-cost low carrier in Africa, if we can answer your question. But it's not easy to, to find. And as Nico um, explained this morning, I think if we, if we try to apply the model in Africa in general, it, it doesn't work. Um, we need to find for each particular market what is the kind of low-cost uh, model that you can bring because each market has got um, its own government environment and constraints, um, its own set of uh, provider constraints, as you mentioned, the airports and the fuel supply or the taxes. So it's all about trying to find the appropriate tweak to your business model for each African market that we try to enter. So it's probably going to take much longer than um, in America or in Europe where the market is much more homogeneous and the same uh, recipe can be applied to multiple bases. Thank you very much. There is what we call Saturn, which is, which is going to be, uh, in January 2018, AU declared that the African, uh, there will be a single African air transport market. 26 countries have uh, made a settlement commitment. Unfortunately, even though 26 of them have made the settlement commitment, only 15 signed 10 days ago in Lome. And the most disappointing part of it was South Africa, <laughs> Nigeria, Kenya, and Egypt did not sign. These are the major traffic originating countries. These are the major players, and yet they have not signed. Why is Africa shying away? Doesn't Africa want its, its population to travel freely? Doesn't Africa want its population, its travelers, to get a cheaper price? Doesn't it want to fill hotels? Why are governments not taking the steps, even though they have committed at a head of state level? Government representative. Hmm? <laughs> you don't want to answer? No, no, I mean, <laughs> no, I think I'll, I mean, I'll, I mean, make an effort. Yes, I'll make an effort to do that. Uh, the most important thing is, uh, I think they are shying from uh, signing is uh, this protect, I mean, protecting their carriers. But I'm quite surprised because uh, Nigeria, as it stands now, do not have any, uh, I mean, uh, any carrier, any local carrier to even to protect um, uh, that market. But again, when we are talking about uh, open up skies, yes, it's all about the reorientation because this is not something new. This has been done before. We look at um, airspace like the American uh, airspace. We look like um, uh, agreements between the uh, ET and SA some time ago when they opened up their skies in terms of bilateral relationships and the kind of traffic that it boosted. These are things that we need to learn from, but it's, it's quite uh, not pleasant for us to, uh, to protect our market, thinking that the more you close up, 
the more traffic you get, or that, that, that doesn't happen, you understand? So I think it's a matter of letting them, letting, reorienting the players, reorienting the authorities, letting them know what benefit we all derive from opening up the skies. And it doesn't go only, be, I mean, it, it's not only limited to airlines, the other chain as well. Intra traffic, uh, it boosts up uh, in terms of trade and I mean trade and, and economics. All these things help. So it's about the orientation. Once they understand what we um, we stand to benefit, then I think they can come on board to um, I mean to agree. Yes, please. And if if we want it to be a little bit uh, provocative, would say in fact the single air. Uh, African single air market agreement doesn't change anything in reality. Uh, we've been talking about this uh, Yamoussoukro decision for so many years, and it doesn't change anything in terms of the low cost uh, travel. Because the reality is the low cost um, uh, travel need is on domestic sectors. So, international links between, let's say, um, Zimbabwe and uh, Namibia. Um, there's a, the flows are very small, and you can discount as much as you want, they're not going to become bigger because there is not enough interdependence between those two economies um, and those two populations to create the traffic flows that will sustain high density, high frequency services. So the, the single air traffic in reality is, um, is a nice to have for the big network carriers such as SAA maybe or Kenya Airways or Ethiopian because it will give them better access to feed their hub going then outside of Africa but for low-cost carrier, it doesn't really make any difference. So what we really need to understand is why do government sign those single air traffic agreements and at the same time um, prevent aviation from growing in their own country? I'm not going to give you names, but there's a country in which we operate where we're trying to fl fly on the biggest uh, domestic route and it's been kept away from us, but that same government is now signing the single air traffic so that there's open access to international uh, links. So it, it's really paradoxical. So I think we need to demonstrate the benefits of a free aviation market for the economy domestically, and then the rest will follow. Thank you. What can airports do? Because in Europe and North America, the low-cost carriers prosper because there are secondary airports. In Africa, there are very few secondary airports. Now, what can existing airports do to allow low-cost operator to come into the market? Okay, that's a good question. I think uh, for the airport, we are one of the stakeholders also within the aviation industry, so we have to look at our operating cost. But one of the issues for us is, of course, trying to be aligned with what the low-cost carrier wants in terms of operating cost. But I think everybody within the aviation sector must be aligned. So reducing the cost, looking at our operating cost, of course, but it's not only the airport have to deal with that. So all the stakeholders, like Civil Aviation Authority, handling company, must be aligned. Uh, as an example, in our airport, we're trying to make uh, specific deals with some airlines, trying to develop our, our traffic, of course, but also we are really looking at uh, trying to keep down our cost. So that's one of the issues, and it's, frankly, it's not so easy uh, because we have a lot of pressure, especially for the investment required sometimes by the states. So, and our position as an airport is, okay, we're going to reduce our cost, but if at the same time we have increased by the Civil Aviation Authority of, I would say, uh, air traffic management at the same time, so why will we reduce our cost if the other stakeholders within the industry are not doing so? So the question also for the cost, on the cost reduction to develop the low-cost carriers is also the share of the value of the aviation sector. So that's one of the issues I think we should deal with that. And when thinking about what is the value of everybody is also the question is, what about the regulation? What about the regulation of the state? 
to incentivize, I will say, all the players within the aviation sector. And I think this is really key, the regulation of the aviation sector to be incentivized to reduce the cost to develop the market. And it's the only way, I, we believe, uh, that we could be, I will say, fairly, I will say, trying to develop more the traffic in Africa, and especially for low-cost carriers. Ahmed. Do you, do you believe FastJet says generally in Africa, unlike Europe and North America, it is the domestic that really allows low-cost operation. Do you share that view? Um, yes and no. Uh, on the one hand, I do agree with him uh, in terms of us at Night Air, you know, we're the largest private airline in Egypt. And it took us, I mean, we were established in 2000, uh, well, we launched operations in 2011, uh, so we're a seven-year-old company. And it took us seven years of lobbying to get access to the domestic market in, in Egypt. Uh, so we did initially start off on the international side. Uh, the regulatory framework within sort of the uh, Egyptian uh, regulatory uh, system allowed competition on the domestic sector. So there was nothing from a regulatory perspective that would stop you. But the reality was quite different uh, to it. Uh, you know, we've launched uh, domestic services for routes, you know, the trunk routes within the country. And we've created significant stimulation and we've actually maintained uh, fares. Uh, we're not a low-cost airline, we're a hybrid airline. We operate, obviously, a fleet of 320s and 321s with business class and the whole product. But from a cost perspective, we are low-cost, you know, every airline is. Um, but again, you know, you know, back to our, you know, the, you know, the, 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 this discussion of, you know, why, uh, I, that's a really puzzling question, to be honest. I mean, we, we find that the market potential is there within Africa. You know, we go to these events every year uh, and we do speak about the potential. Uh, we look at sort of, you know, countries like Ethiopia, uh, countries like Morocco, who have actually implemented open skies in various degrees, liberalized the market, and we've seen a huge uh, benefit directly to uh, their national carrier, state-owned or not, uh, but more importantly, uh, you know, to the economy, to investment, to tourism, to employment. Uh, but it tends to be this hesitance. And, you know, you mentioned Egypt was one of the countries that didn't actually sign up. Uh, and you'll find that in most cases, jurisdictions that, I know this is generally speaking, but jurisdictions that have state-owned carriers who are not commercially uh, run uh, in the right way, tend to have this kind of protective uh, cocoon around them, which clearly never works. Uh, it's a loss of opportunity economically. Uh, these uh, Carriers tend to be obviously loss makers. Uh, when I look at a carrier like Egypt there, this is a carrier which is geographically in a fantastic location, a uh, huge population in Egypt of, of 100 million, you know, uh, the tourism market, yet, uh, you know, we uh, haven't really reached sort of the, 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 the scale uh, there, uh, similar to, let's say, Ethiopian airline or even Turkish airline uh, and so on. So it's, it's something that you need to continuously drive. I think, you know, what we've accepted within Nile Air is the need to continuously uh, lobby and push uh, into access into these markets. But at the same time, there are also opportunities out there. I'll say, for example, for us, most of our network is uh, predominantly really focused on the Middle Eastern side. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, we uh, fly to 10 airports in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, I'm sure if I ask most people here, yeah, they'll probably name three, maybe four airports only in Saudi Arabia. But we were able to kind of launch uh, international services to unserved uh, new airports. Uh, in fact, I think you know, we were the first international carrier in six of those ten airports. Uh, and you create and stimulate. It's not necessarily a low-cost airline model. I think that's just a model in, in, that's proven that there is untapped potential. There's no reason that what we did, for example, in the Saudi market couldn't be replicated in the African market. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a continent of obviously 1.2 billion. The economic activity is increasing. Um, but open skies isn't everything. Uh, there are hurdles that also need to be removed in terms of sort of visa restrictions. 
uh, the, the, the freedom of movement. Uh, you know, one of our routes that we operate into, uh, into Africa suffers from the fact that visas are usually issued at the very last moment, if issued at all. You know, that then presents a major hurdle for any commercial entity to actually plan and manage when you've got restrictions such as uh, visas in place. Richard, what do you do in, in West Africa? What we need to understand is to uh, basically look at uh, the, I mean, LCC as a whole. Now, uh, when that concept comes in mind, which though we, we, I mean, we know it was initiated by uh, Southwest and uh, Ryanair as champion this, and back home in Africa, we are looking at cost leadership. Now, when cost leadership comes in, the main thing is, what are we doing to cut down operational costs in order to pass on these, uh, um, I mean, uh, these costs to the passengers. I mean, in, term, in terms of fares, give them a very cheap fares. It all comes again looking at uh, infrastructure, IATA features of uh, an LCC gives you, I mean, tells you uh, flying to a secondary airport. Um, uh, having a, a very dense single cabin, um, so uh, cutting costs on uh, GDS. So we are in Africa. For instance, I operate from Accra to Nigeria. That's AWA. Now, how do I even serve the, I mean, the traveling public in Nigeria without being on the GDS? So uh, per definition of LCC, I'm supposed to use my direct channels um, web bookings, just web, book, I mean, web bookings alone. So how do I get access to the traveling public beyond Ghana? And it's very difficult. How many of them even have access to, um, I mean, uh, direct internet connectivity? That is even one. So I'll give AW, I mean, I'll use AWB as a case study. Uh, some years ago, I think three years ago, we started operating to Nigeria. And uh, we were operating a daily flight. We started with a daily flight. It will interest you to know that uh, at a point in time, we weren't even with an, I mean, with an ASK of 50. It was an Embraer E145, 50-seater. We, we, I mean, we weren't even getting 20% um, load factor because we weren't on the GDS. The market out there couldn't even see our settles in order to even take it. But here in the case, we pride ourselves as a low cost and we need to serve that market. Now, let's look at what happened. When we went on GDS, from, three weekly, um, from four weekly flights, we, need to, we have now increased frequency to five daily flights. You understand? But again, it comes with a cost. Because you need to serve that market, and you need to make sure that at the end of the day, you are out there. The GDS is also another cost, because yes, even though your direct channel will, I mean, in quotes, comes with no cost, because at the end of the day, um, it's going to be uh, between you and the passenger. GDS, you have to pay charges. So it is not entirely low, as in low costs. You understand? It's, I mean, so it's not entirely so. You need to make sure that there are some things that you have control over, others you do not have control. So how do you make sure at the end of the day you cut down costs in our operational, your operational expenses to pass on low fares to the passengers? We are in an environment whereby uh, regional taxes, fares, and charges are not equitable. Equitable in the sense that now, operating into these sub-regions, you realize that cost, I mean, I mean uh, for fares and charges and um, handling is skyrocketing. And I can give you a typical example on I mean, airports in the I mean, West Coast region because as a case study, we have applied to I mean, about three of these uh, airports and the cost is extremely high. A turnaround time for a smaller aircraft you, you are paying not less than $1,800. So how do you, from the start, from starters, how do we even start a turnaround $1,800 
uh, handling companies solely monopoly. So whatever they give you, you, I mean, even if you try to negotiate, it becomes a different thing all, I mean, all together. So it makes your cost base very high, then naturally as a carrier, if you are operating and you are not meeting your DOC, your direct operational costs, then you don't have to be in business. You understand? So how do we cut down all these operational costs, all these operational expenses, in order to even charge very low to stimulate market drive traffic? That is a problem. So are we saying there is no feature for, uh, for low-cost carrier in Africa? Is that what we are trying to say? We will say there is a future. Uh, so we, uh, I mean, I have spelled out all these indicators. Now, looking at the charges, what can we do? What, what can African governments do? What can the airport authorities do in order to cut down these charges? W once you do that, the airlines will also, uh, I mean, have a very low operational, I mean, cost in order to pass on to the passenger. So now, currently, uh, as a stance now, I see ECOWAS has come together and uh, they have uh, commissioned IATA to have a common policy, a common policy to, uh, to introduce common fares and charges for uh, airports within the sub-region. When that is achieved and is passed, then it means we are all going to benefit. Once we have a low operational cost, it will be passed on to the passengers. But that's going to be also for the, uh, uh, for the other airlines. It's not going to be only for you. No, no, it's not going to, so it's, it's not going to be for only AWA, it's going to be the, I mean, for the airlines in the sub-region. And of course, not only the airlines, I mean, the airlines is not going to benefit alone, but of course, the H chain, the other, uh, I mean, the other uh, chain collection as well. Yes, please. I think for the future of low cost to take off in Africa, um, we need to understand that it has to come through the private sector. There's very few public uh, state-owned low-cost carriers in the world. Mango is one, uh, but I think that's probably about it. Um, so um, the low-cost phenomenon will only come in if in every African country there is a, an environment that is conducive to investment from the private sector. Nobody's going to put money in aviation if it doesn't have a good return. And to entice this investment from the private sector, you need to have a level playing field, meaning making sure the authorities will give you the same chance to compete uh, against the state-owned carriers, because in most of those countries, there is, or will be, or have been state-owned carriers, and it's this national um, desire to have your own uh, airline is not going to go away easily. You need to have a stable regulatory environment, where you know from a tax point of view, from a cost point of view, from an infrastructure point of view, that there's visibility, because you cannot go in and out very easily in this business. If you invest in your assets, you need to make sure that you can use them for five, 10, 20 years. Um, and unless the governments don't uh, understand that they need to make this um, environment available for the private sector to come in and invest, low cost is not going to happen in Africa. So we need to convince, it's our role as a low cost carrier, to convince each jurisdiction that this is the environment that we wish, and then we can invest and grow the market. Okay, I understand what you are saying. Now, there are markets in Africa mm -hmm. that are big enough to allow low-cost operation. Domestic South Africa is one. Domestic Nigeria is another. Uh, Egypt, domestic Egypt. Domestic Ethiopia, if it opens, is, is another. <laughs> But also, there are, there are international potential for low-cost carrier. I don't think the European carriers, the European low-cost carriers, just remain in UK or, or, or in France or in Germany. They operate from one country to the other, even though EU today is considered one country until Britain leaves. Now, Between Zambia 
and South Africa, between Zimbabwe and South Africa, between Kenya and Uganda, between Tanzania and Kenya, yeah. there must be traffic. Sure. Between Nigeria and West African countries, yeah. there is traffic. How can low-cost carriers do to participate in this market? What do they want? Do they want to invest today so that when the traffic reaches 230 million and that you will be ready for that traffic flow tomorrow? If you are not in today, it will be very difficult to just come at the end and, and, and gain your right, rightful place. You have to invest in it. What are you doing? to bring that about now? I think, uh, uh, you know, airlines have a responsibility, obviously, to be very uh, commercially driven in their decision-making process when it comes to sorts of expansion. Uh, just because a significant trunk route exists or market exists uh, shouldn't be our main focus. Uh, I'll go back to an example that we had uh, in Nile Air when we launched our first African destination was Port Sudan. Uh, between Cairo and Port Sudan. Now, there wasn't really much traffic between Cairo and Port Sudan as a point-to-point -point market. It really wasn't significant. Uh, however, what we did realize that there was significant potential coming in from connecting on from, from Europe, uh, connecting on to Port Sudan. It's, it's a ex almost an exclusive diving uh, region around Port Sudan. So, you know, when you, when you today look at our services uh, to that city, the majority are actually sort of Scandinavians and Swiss nationals flying into Cairo and connecting. And I think that was one of the reasons why we started to push towards, you know, building partnerships with other uh, organizations. Just this week, you know, we launched our first co-chair agreement with uh, Pegasus Airlines in, in, in uh, Turkey. We launched also our first interline agreement with Fly Dubai this week. And we're currently in discussions with actually Ethiopian Airways and Tunis Air in Africa to uh, obviously have partnerships also in place. So it's again about taking uh, certain uh, smart risks, uh, understanding your market. You know, there are destinations that at first glance don't necessarily make sense. But the potential is there. Uh, you only need to look at sort of sort of the growth of, of low cost carriers in, in, in Europe or in Asia, where you know city pairs that you know just a few years back we would have thought, where's the traffic there? All of a sudden they are healthy, profitable uh, routes that are driving benefits for the airline, the airports, and local economy. Uh, and it's it's very clear sort of going forward that you know, you know growing partnerships and ties between airlines. Uh, is going to be crucial uh, in this highly competitive, low margin industry, surviving on your own, be it a small carrier or a large international carrier, is going to become more and more difficult. You know, it's, it's uh, I think, you know, one of the previous panelists, you know, mentioned that the airline industry is, is, is sexy. People from outside think it is sexy, but my God, is it capital intensive and it's, it's full of heartache. You know, in, 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 you know I, I'd say again from, from my experience at Nile Air in the last few years, you know, in Egypt we've had, you know, two political, major political events. We've had sort of a couple of aviation incidents. We've had a huge devaluation of our local currency. We've had towards the issues. So, you know, running an airline in itself is challenging enough, uh, let alone sort of, you know, when you've got, you know, these uh, external factors. And it's just something we have to accept. You know, we can complain about rising oil prices. We can complain about a war. We can complain about terrorism. But it's part and parcel of our business. And, you know, it's one thing, you know, just kind of using these uh, as excuses to justify, you know, uh, failure, uh, and it's another actually trying to find solutions and workarounds around it. And there always are. You know, or now almost 75-80% of the national carriers are losing money continuously, are getting government support, burning it more now. Do you, as business people, intend to buy some of these national carriers and use their rights? Well, Probably <laughs> that gives you enough, enough muscle within the government when you are a shareholder in those carriers. 
To be honest, I don't, I don't think necessarily, you know, being state-owned is, is always a negative uh, thing. I mean, we've got very successful global airlines in Africa uh, 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 and outside of Africa where they are state-owned, but they are run uh, very much in an independent manner. They're not the rule, they're the exception. Uh, however, it does show that when there is kind of political will, it does really matter if you are state or, or, or private, you know, if, if, uh, if the drive is there and the will is there to actually uh, have a, a, a viable uh, and beneficial uh, airline, it can happen. Can happen. I mean, there's a reason why when you look at sort of U.S. airlines, you know, a decade and a half ago, uh, where they were financially, when you look at them today, reporting margins, you know, upwards of 15%, 20%, envy of the world. Yeah, so I think that's, that's the key point here is that um, it is a very risky investment. It's a very difficult business. And um, we are extremely vulnerable to any shock, uh, devaluation, uh, yeah. terrorism, uh, diseases, etc. So if we want a um, low-cost carrier to grow in Africa, it has to be uh, pan-African because you cannot afford to have all your risk in the same country. And I think the advantage that we have as FastJet is that if we manage to grow in enough jurisdictions, we can actually move the assets around. And if there's a shock happening in one country because there's a devaluation or something going on, we can then quickly reallocate our capacity to a country that's going to be more uh, attractive. And that is the key uh, advantage because there are not so many countries who individually can sustain a big operation. Maybe Egypt, maybe Nigeria, um, but South Africa, of course, but not that many more. You, you manage a number of airports. Do you accept if a low-cost carrier comes to you and says, I will operate between the three airports that you manage in the area? and make those airports good traffic hubs. Will you be doing something for them? Of course, uh, of course our job uh, and my day-to-day -day job is trying to attract new carriers in our airports. Uh, so definitely. Uh, but I think one of the, also one of the issues uh, the airline are facing, and I'm talking a lot to many carriers, uh, is really uh, transparency also. Uh, it's not easy for airlines trying to look at new market, but uh, without, uh, I will say, competing with the same rules, especially with the domestic, I will say, flag carriers. So, and I've got a lot of questions from airlines in Africa or outside Africa concerning transparency, the rule applying, but also uh, what is so very important, fiscality, sustainability, and the capacity to deal with the transfer of funds. That's also one of the issues. So, but coming back to, to your question, I'll say, of course, uh, we're trying to have some specific negotiations, especially when we are dealing with a network of airports, but we also have to deal with transparency and applying the same rules to any carriers. So that some, sometimes can become tricky uh, because we would like uh, probably uh, to have a deal with certain carriers that we, we more believe in. So, for instance, uh, will we apply the same rules of incentives for a carrier that we know is always uh, flying at loss? Will it be, I would say, sustainable in the midterm? So, so we have to deal with our incentive scheme on the, our contract based on, on several indicators or targets to deal with the airline, but in a transparency matter. So that's, it's for us, it's a way trying to invest on some specific carriers that we know will, will make more volume for the airport. And of course, we are looking at the business model of the airline. Because if we are negotiating with a carrier, which only be a cannibalization from another carrier, what would be our interest in terms of growing traffic? So, of course, we more believe in the local carriers uh, for Western Africa in, in our airports. We're trying to push uh, a lot of carriers, but, uh, but we are not the only one, and we have to deal with also the situation, with the monopolistic situation sometime of other stakeholders like the handling company. Anything from the audience? No? Over there. Everybody. People are hungry, I guess. <laughs> No, there's one up there. Okay.
Thank you, Guillermo. Thank you. Uh, I'm Wolfgang Tome, uh, publisher of ADC News. My question to you and your panel is, low cost, isn't that a myth? Be it legacy airlines, be it so-called low cost carriers, they all have literally the same cost environment in Africa. There are no alternate airports like in Europe where you get cheaper handling, landing, parking, and all of that. Shouldn't it be called low fare airlines? Yeah, I think, Wolfgang, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's, um, it's very difficult to achieve low costs in, uh, in Africa, and it's, and it's all about relative to what. And the reality is we're trying to achieve low fares so we can stimulate the market, but um, we are not really a low-cost carrier when we're flying Embraer 145, 50-seater, obviously, it's a very high-seat cost aircraft. Um, but, um, but we're trying to achieve low fares and to stimulate the market. So you, you're absolutely right. I think we should try to call ourselves a low fare airline or maybe a hybrid airline um, or a lower cost airline, but probably not low cost. The issue is to mm. deal with the high cost and low fares. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's hybrid, you know. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I, I would perhaps maybe slightly disagree with that. Yes, I mean, there are basic fundamentals, cost structures that we all have to, you know, we all have to pay for our fuel, we all have pilots, we all have mm -hmm. these salaries. But no, there are, there are certain uh, ways that you can get cost advantages. You know, yes, again, there are obviously issues in terms of airport uh, costs being high, taxation being high, uh, but there are significant means of addressing costs uh, within any organization. You know, for example, yes, we, we, we are, um, uh, available more three GDSs, which is obviously a high cost, and for particular segments, our presence is, is important. But you know, we're try, you know moving towards sort of NDC, getting more direct sales, bypassing the GDSs. That's a significant kind of advantage uh, to you. We are launching our brand new sort of you know app and website in August. Uh, again, that's just to drive greater direct sales. Uh, you know, yeah, we are a 320, 321 operator. Uh, However, we would say that we've actually got a cost ratio, CASC, which is almost in line with European low-cost carriers, mm -hmm. uh, despite them obviously enjoying significantly larger scale and a much more liberalized market. Uh, and again, given sort of maybe the, the nature of competition of, uh, within sort of the African continent being dominated by sort of state-owned airlines, which are, you know, have significantly higher costs, I think, you know, there is, you know, ample room for for low-cost carriers, hybrid airlines, private organizations to actually try to mitigate that risk. Yes, we're never going to have sort of the similar uh, cost structure as you know, other organizations at this point in time, uh, but sort of the drive towards sort of getting airports to incentivize. We've seen that, we've been, you know, that's been kind of maybe a cornerstone of one of uh, our, our policies is, is actually almost, you know, forcing airports that if you do want to, you know, us to take on the risk, then you obviously have to work as a partner with us. Uh, we're not saying subsidize, that's not every word we want to use, but it has to be a win-win situation uh, on both halves. Again, dealing with local authorities, you know, the issue of trapped funds, you know, that, that's an issue that we, we still face here. And again, it's about, you know, getting the authorities on board and understanding that in the end of the day, is it worth losing a vital air service that's supporting your local airport, employment of your airport, tourism, your hotels around it, over a factor which can be easily resolved. Any other question? Yes. Hi, my name is Marcel from NACO, Netherlands Airport Consultants. Thanks for a very interesting discussion. You asked the question to the airport operator, what can airports do to support the um, low-cost carriers? Can we get the view of the airlines on that question, please? Well, we've been working together to develop services uh, in the past. I must say that most airports in Africa now offer the same kind of support that uh, you get in America or in Europe in terms of uh, consulting, uh, access to data, um, access to the authorities. So I think we're getting, um, in terms of uh, advice, the, the proper uh, level of support. Um, what we need to have now is uh, the cost uh, component, of course, because in most of those airports, um, there's not uh, many choices of suppliers. Uh, the tax uh, level is very high, and obviously then your, your cost base starts 
from a very high level and it's difficult to stimulate the market. But I think from my experience, um, I've seen very professional engagements with um, most African airports and they do understand that it's a very competitive market even for airports now to attract services. Uh, as uh, Sabine showed this morning, um, typically Victoria Falls Airport is a competitor of Mauritius or, or Zanzibar. And I think this is something that the airports do understand uh, already quite well in Africa. Maybe you want to... Yeah, I think there's definitely been an improvement there. I think, you know, a lot, uh, 10 years ago, airports in Africa tended, you know, when you met, met them, to present you sort of with issues like, you know, our runway length or our terminal, or brand new terminal. And then at the end of the day, that's interesting. But for us, that's not the first question we ever ask is, you know, how, how, how shiny is your terminal? But now there's a certainly say airports and in events such as this, it's been brilliant because they're starting to understand how airlines are thinking. You know, we're looking after, you know, what, what the demand is, what the potential is, getting us into touch with sort of local tourism authorities, with local bodies, getting us into contact with the local airlines in terms of you know, how we can work together. So I think the mindset has certainly improved significantly with dealing with African airports. They've now realized you know, what airlines need and require uh, to make a service uh, viable. But you mentioned one important point is the investment and the cost of the investment. So the airport must really take care about what type of investment and what will be the impact on their overall business plan on the long term, not only in terms of, I will say, loans or direct cost of the investment, but definitely also about the operating cost, because sometimes we saw for on airports that we now manage, we had a very huge, very nice infrastructure, very great, but at the end, too much capacity, but you have to deal on a day-to-day -day basis, and that's the cost for the airport operator, and at the end, the stakeholders, the airline have to pay for that. So what is important is to be able to manage the growth, I would say, but progressively having the right capacity for the right cost for the airline. Okay, are we, are we saying we try to call ourselves a low-cost carrier, but we operate in a high-cost environment. Yeah, yeah. Our, our costs are exactly the same with other carriers. Fuel, is, fuel price is high in Africa. Airports are monopolies, they charge us the same. Mm. Traffic between the states are not that big to allow a proper low-cost uh, operation. Are we now concluding that yes, we come into the market to see what the future will be, but today Africa is not ripe for a low-cost carrier? Is that the conclusion? No. No, because again, again, looking at the market, no, there, there are benefits to it. I mean, yes, you'll, we'll go back to the cost perspective. Yes, you know, we have a higher cost environment. But I would say, let's say, if you look at sort of the IRT, the IRT will tell you, for example, labor accounts for, let's say, 21% of the cost of any of the average airline. In Africa, it's significantly lower. I mean, our labor costs in Africa tend to be lower. So there are advantages as well uh, from a cost perspective. The market isn't as competitive. It's not as competitive, let's say, Europe, where, you know, you talk about average yields in Europe of, you know, sort of, you know, hovering between sort of 40 to $50. No, the average yield for a comparable distance in Africa is still higher. It, it, it's, it's the fact, I think, the frustration with Africa is just we all know the potentials there, and the market does exist, but it's these, these, these hurdles and challenges that are stopping us from doing it. But the market is there. There's no doubt about it that, you know, one day there could be services between, you know, uh, uh, you know let's say, for example, Alexandria. How do you push that envelope? How do you push that development? You know, by continuously uh, uh, lobbying to get these changes, because, you know, that's the only way. You know, we can all complain sort of the authorities or the, the f uh, regulatory framework. But, again, we've seen that, yes, despite the sort of challenges that FastJet uh, faced initially, they've obviously been able to adapt successfully. Uh, and that's it, it's understanding your market. It's not one size fits all. You can't apply a model f which is suitable in Europe to Africa. 
Uh, but I'm confident that certainly in the next sort of like decade or so, Africa has got the potential to be unbelievably successful uh, for all organizations involved there. Even more than Europe or America, because there's no alternative mode of transport. The distances are so great that you cannot have train. Yeah. The roads also would cost too much to, to, to construct. So in fact, I think there's even more potential than in other jurisdictions. Um, but it's a, it's a matter of being patient. Yeah. Then I think we can conclude by saying today, no, tomorrow, yes, because the future is in our hands. We have the ability to change all this. So uh, if uh, governments are coming together to make sure that uh, taxes are reduced, even uh, physical barriers, two thirds of uh, African traffic, you need to, I mean, countries need to even secure visa before you get access. Ironically, you look at uh, America and Europe, have more liberal access to Africa more than Africans themselves. You understand? So, so, so today it looks very difficult. I mean, quite difficult. But you today, operate in Equus. <laughs> Equus is available. Exactly. To Equus within within Equus. You you don't even need passport. Passport, yeah. So why why didn't you grow? <laughs> <laughs> but you. <laughs> You, 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 are, you, are, you are not aiming at only ECOWAS, you are looking at the other no, aspects no. of ECOWAS. I'm, I'm just trying to understand the logic. Yeah. ECOWAS is open. The rest of the continent may not be open, but ECOWAS is open. The population of ECOWAS is mobile. Okay? Why didn't a low-cost carrier succeed in West Africa, in ECOWAS? Is move, if movement is open, is the sky is open as well? No. The sky is closed? Sky is closed. So, I mean, <laughs> there are barriers. That makes it very difficult for you. It's very true. I mean, you know, the word open skies gets kind of thrown around. I mean, we've got, for example, sort of that Kamisa agreement in East Africa, which is a framework which does allow sort of, you know, uh, almost virtually open skies uh, traffic. But again, it's actually getting it applied. Uh, you know, we've got, for example, uh, Eritrean Airways, which is obviously the, 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 the state-owned carrier based in, in Eritrea. Now, they operate Fifth Freedom between Khartoum and Cairo, uh, between two mm. excellent. Uh, but then when private uh, carriers from any other nation try to actually apply to fly between the two capitals, it's no. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you know, during the military government in Ethiopia, one of the government leaders went to a place called Harar in East Africa very close to Somalia, and he was making a speech. He was confronted by a very strong question from his audience. They said, because of this, this does not work. Because of this, this does not work. Because of this, this does not work. And the man looked around and says, you know, a Christian never gives us hope. When he looked around, they were all Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Muslims too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.